What is the primary biblical image of Yeshua that the disciple Peter used? You might think Messiah, or Savior, or Lamb of Elohim. How about a shepherd? Actually, the primary biblical image one of his disciples, Peter, used to portray Yeshua is the cornerstone. The first time Peter mentions Yeshua in, as the cornerstone is shortly after Pentecost. After Yeshua's resurrection and the Holy Spirit came filling the disciples like tongues of fire, Peter and John were dragged before the religious leaders to explain how they had healed a man. With the courage of the Holy Spirit, Peter boldly proclaimed in front of the very same religious leaders that had Yeshua put to death that the man was healed in the name and the power of Yeshua. And then he quoted Psalms 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. Peter said, he, Yeshua, is the stone the builders rejected which has become the capstone or cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 11 and 12. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 11 and 12. Now, in our day and age, unless you're a stone nation, you probably don't think much about cornerstones because most of our houses don't have cornerstones. We have poured concrete foundations, studded walls, but in the first century Israel, their primary building material, or at least their foundation material, was stone. The most important stone in the whole house was the cornerstone. The cornerstone was the first stone to be laid in construction. It became the foundation upon which all other stones were set. The cornerstone had to be the perfect stone and set just so because if it was off, even a little bit, the whole building was off. How big is this city? 1,500 miles square. It's 1,500 miles up in the air. Those who are in construction know how frustrating it can be when a foundation is not plumb. Peter tells, Peter tells us Yeshua Messiah is the stone that was rejected. He was rejected by the Jews. He was rejected by the Gentiles. When Yeshua took the sins of the world upon himself, even his own father turned his back on him. At least for a little while. But because he himself was sinless, Yahweh raised him up and placed him as the cornerstone. He is the foundation. There is no other foundation upon which we can build our lives which will result in our salvation because any other foundation will be flawed. Peter tells us, no one can avoid the cornerstone. You are either going to trip and stumble over it and reject him or you are going to accept him and build your life upon him. Not just on his teachings, but on the person of Yeshua. The one thing you can't do is ignore him. 1 Peter 2 verse 5 says, You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yeshua Messiah. New Revised Standard Version, 1 Peter 2, 5 reads a little differently. It says, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. In other words, there is a choice I need to make. First, am I willing to build myself on Yeshua as the cornerstone? 
Are we building on Yeshua as the cornerstone or on some other foundation? Building on Yeshua means we put our faith in Him. But it also means we set our lives according to His. We line our lives up according to His. And second, will I allow Yahweh to work on my rough edges to be built into Yahweh's spiritual house? Stones that come out of a quarry usually aren't ready to be used for building, at least not right away. They need to be chiseled and formed to fit the location the mason wants to place it. Without taking the rough edges off, it makes, makes, makes it difficult to set it stably on the foundation. It's also difficult for any other stones to rest next to it on top of, of it. The imagery Peter has given us is a human version of the Temple of Jerusalem. It's interesting that today if you go to Jerusalem, you can go down to see the Temple Mount. And it was built, and they say in some places they had stones that weighed tens of thousands of pounds. I've been there. It's big. It's huge. It's like a giant house. One stone. How they moved it is beyond me. You can't even slip a piece of paper in the cracks. They were perfectly shaped to fit together into a foundation. Even when we are saved by Yahweh through Yeshua, we still have some rough edges on, in our life. Our mouth, our attitudes, our anger, our self-centeredness, our pride, they still haven't been changed yet. And Yeshua has given us new life. He has forgiven us our sins, but our attitudes and behaviors haven't caught up with our new life yet. We require a process of chiseling off our rough edges. We can't do this on our own, but we can allow Yahweh to do it. As we were reminded in reading Peter, Yahweh said, Be holy because I am holy. In our new life in Messiah, we are meant to be set apart for him. That's what it means to be holy. Set apart for Yahweh. Our life should reflect that cornerstone. We are citizens of Yahweh's kingdom, not our culture. So we must ask ourselves, am I willing to be shaped and used as a living stone for Yahweh's purpose? Am I allowing Yahweh to take off the sharp edges which do not reflect him? So he can fit us into where he wants us to be. As living stone building on Yahweh's, the Yeshua's cornerstone, we should notice that we are not alone. Yahweh is building a spiritual house. One stone does not make a house. One stone can't even make a wall. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians about how we together are built on Messiah, the cornerstone, to become Yahweh's holy temple. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of Yahweh, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Yeshua Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto a holy temple in the Master, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of Yahweh through the Spirit. It begins with Yeshua as the cornerstone. Then the apostles and the prophets who form the foundation. And then we as living stones build upon this foundation. On top of those who have gone before us in the faith and next to each other to form a spiritual house, as Peter calls it, or a holy temple, as Paul calls it. You can imagine this is a big house with lots of stones each representing the billions of believers in years past and today. Together we become Yahweh's new living temple. We become the place where Yahweh lives by his spirit. Too often, 
in our individualistic culture, we have been taught that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Therefore, all I need is myself and Yeshua. I don't need other believers. But more often, the scripture says that we, together, are the dwelling place or temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why Yeshua said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am with them. Matthew 18, verse 20. In order to experience Yahweh's power in the presence of the Spirit, we need to be together. So what happens if we don't continue to meet together, whether in worship or Bible studies or fellowship? We draw away from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's harder to live as believers a believer's life without other believers. When I lived in Wisconsin, I had to drive all the way down to Milwaukee to go to church. There was nobody up in northern Wisconsin. It was like a three-hour drive one way. On a motorcycle. So, it's hard when you're by yourself. This is a blessing, folks. We have people here that's close by. We are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. We are a part of a great movement of Yahweh's Spirit, which the Bible calls the church. The church is not a building. The church is the people of Yahweh. Yahweh chooses to work through the church, but in order for the power of the Spirit to manifest, it requires us to work together to accomplish it. That's why Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter verse, chapter 2, verse 5, we are built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yeshua Messiah. We are a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. In Yeshua's day, priests were men set aside by Yahweh to serve Yahweh on behalf of the people of Yahweh. The priests did Yahweh's work. The priests did the work of worship. The priests served Yahweh in the holy places on behalf of the people. They made the spiritual sacrifices. But now that Yeshua has made the one-time sacrifice for us all by taking our sins upon himself, we all have become priests. Didn't I tell you that? We were asking about that a couple weeks back. We no longer need someone else to do the work of ministry for us. We don't need a priest to do it. We don't need the pastor to do it. We don't need paid professionals to serve Yahweh for us. We are all able to do Yahweh's work. Yahweh has gifted each one of us with talents. William does things I can't do. All of you each have your special talents to do in a congregation. Skills. Abilities so we can work together to accomplish Yahweh's mission. We don't need to sit and wait for someone else to do it for us. We don't need to sit and wait for any congregation of Yahweh's denominations to do it. We don't need their permission. What we set out to do is our business. We can do it. We have already been equipped with everything we need right here. Right now. To serve each other and to minister to our community because we together have the Holy Spirit. We just need to do it. We need to use what Yahweh has given us to accomplish his mission, which, as Yeshua said, was to make disciples. Yahweh is inviting us all to offer our spiritual sacrifices. Now, what are these spiritual sacrifices? What are some of the spiritual sacrifices Yahweh expects us to make? 
well, gifts and talents for one. Yahweh gives us our ability for a reason, so we will use them for his purpose and not for our own selfish gain. We have praise. First Peter 2, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You don't eat pork, you're peculiar. You keep the Sabbath, you're peculiar. You don't do Christmas and Easter, you're peculiar. You're set apart, you're different. That you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We center our lives around continual praise to Yahweh. Once, when the religious leader told Yeshua to rebuke the people for shouting in praise in Yeshua, Yeshua said, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. We make a sacrifice of praise. Then we have financial gifts. Some of us can do that. The gifts that the believers had sent to Paul are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, is pleasing to Yahweh. Philippians 4, verse 18. We offer our money and possessions freely to, freely to spread the gospel. Then we have love for another. Sometimes it is a sacrifice to love others because we may not like them. Life, live a life of love just as Yeshua loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to Yahweh. Ephesians 5 verse 2. We offer up love to Yahweh and to others. Ephesians 5 2 and, and walk in love. As Messiah also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to Yahweh for a sweet smelling Savior. And do not forget to do good to those that share with, and share with others, for with such sacrifices Yahweh is pleased. Hebrews 13, verse 15 and 16. We do good and share freely with others. Hebrews 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer this sacrifice of praise to Yahweh continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, Yahweh is well pleased. And then we have ourselves. In Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, therefore, and brethren, by the mercies of Yahweh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Yahweh, which is our reasonable service. It's not above and beyond. It's just what you're expected to do. We offer ourselves and our wills to Yahweh's control. We offer our gifts and talents back to him. Psalm 118, verse 22, The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of, of the corner. This is Yahweh's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which Yahweh has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Why can we, we rejoice in this day? because Yahweh has made it. But we also rejoice in today because the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Have we chosen to rest on that cornerstone? Are we being the living house where the Spirit dwells as we regularly gather together as believers? Are we giving Yahweh our spiritual sacrifices by using our gifts and talents to serve each other? Then we have living stones. Uh, Jim Staley wrote an article that helped me see more clearly what living stones are. And we also read in, this, in the Torah reading today about building uh, altars. Stones cannot, for altars, stones cannot be, no tool can be touched to these stones. It's just plain field stones. Deuteronomy 27, verse 1 to 4, Then Moses and the elder of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. 
So it shall be on the day when you cross the Jordan to the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime, and write on them all the words of this law when you cross over, so that you may enter the land which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh the Elohim of your fathers promised you. So it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebal, these stones, as I am commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Cross over. What does the phrase mean in the original, original language? The Hebrew word just so happens to be the word number 5680, Ibri, which is the word Hebrew. In Hebrew, Hebrew means crossed over one. When the Israelites go from the wandering place in the desert to the actual crossing over into the promised land, they are set up these stones in a particular peculiar place, particular place, but the key here is crossing over. It's moving from a side that is dead to one that is full of life. We're moving from a side that is dead to one that is full of life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone in Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things have passed. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. John 5.24, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to into life. These scriptures tell us that if we are in Messiah, that we are crossed over to him. Spiritually speaking, this means that the promised land represents Yeshua, and to be in Messiah is to actually be in the promised land. Being in the promised land doesn't mean that you can lay in your hammock and sip daiquiris all day. It means that you are now in a proper covenant with the Father, and you get the assistance of his Son to help you destroy the giants in the land. He will help you take back the land that is to be given to you. This consummation all happens in Shechem. With, uh, with these living stones that are covered in lime and have the commandments written all over their faces. And what's the difference between hewn stones and living stones? Hewn stones have been cut, chiseled, and formed by man, by man to fit the way man wants them to fit for building purposes. They all look the same. The final appearance is the stones themselves fitting tightly together to accomplish a single purpose. But building something with living, unhewn stones is far more difficult. You are each an unhewn stone. You are each a stone, a living stone. Instead of taking perfectly square stones and stacking them to form a wall, imagine taking round stones of every shape and size and trying them to form a wall with them. This is the way altars were made by the ancient Hebrews. We just read that in our scriptures today. In order to do this, you need stones of every shape and size to fit into the odd spaces that would be created by the building process. The most common stones were the little pieces that were sometimes no bigger than a rock that you would skip across a lake. These small rocks would be the ones that were wedged in the cracks between the larger stones to keep them in place. One could say that they were holding up the arms of the larger stones. 1 Peter 2, 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of Yahweh, and precious. You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yeshua Messiah. And as you can see from this verse, stones represent people. Those who are not a Messiah are hewn stones. Man has formed them. They all look alike. 
The stones and the resulting structures show off all their glory when seen by men. The wall is strong and each stone fits perfectly in place and is forced to look just like the other. There is no room for the smaller stones or stones of unusual form. Unfortunately, many religious institutions look just like this. On the other hand, a house built by living stones requires each one to be used. Each one of you are being used and you will be used. It's a community of believers that is diverse and welcome each and every member. It understands that even the smallest rock is of utmost importance as they help keep the larger rocks in place. Every person, regardless of how they're made, is looked upon with great value in this spiritual house, the spiritual altar that Yeshua is making. Yahweh does not desire that man would change a single thing in how he made him. For before the foundations of the earth, he knew the exact place that their stone would fit into the wall. Incredibly enough, in Hebrew, the word for stone is number 0068, Eben. Sped elf, bet, nun. In the ancient paleo pictograph, where each letter had its own meaning, Eben meant the strong leader of the house brings life. And of course, the strong leader is Yeshua, the chief cornerstone. What's amazing is that the word son in Hebrew is ben, spelled bet, none. The only thing missing for the house of life to actually bring forth the life it was created for is the addition of the letter elf, the strong leader, Yeshua. Not only does Eben and Ben sound the same, they come from the same root word, Bena, which is Hebrew word for build. To build, number 1129, Bena, the house of Yahweh. He uses living stones, Eben, that are carefully put into place by the master builder, his son, Ben. To be a living stone is to be a living son. In addition, to be a son means that you are now commissioned to partner with the maker in building up the house of Yahweh. He's got a job for you. Not only are you a builder, but you are also the actual stone that he is going to use to do the building. Now that we know that we are the stones and what he wants to do with them, let's get back to the building. Unfortunately, when all the stones are in place, it's not exactly attractive. There are larger stones, medium stones, round, square, and shards of stones wedged in the cracks along the gaps all over the place. It appears weak standing next to the wall of man-made and perfectly hewn stones. But the father sees this, and while the proud stone wall of man bask in its beauty, look at my beautiful building. Gloating over the disjointed and ugly stone wall besides it, the father adds one more thing to complete his living wall. He understands that a diverse wall using every member and build the way he desires with the chief cornerstone Yeshua will not look strong or attractive. It will look more like a pile of rocks ready to fall at any moment. But the man-made rocks have forgotten that they were not to be seen by man, lest they fall into temptation and pride. They are to be covered by another kind of rock, crushed limestone that would be made into a plaster. It will completely surround the entire heap of stones. Then, on top of it, the Torah will be written on the surface, completely surrounding the living stones that now lie hidden behind its beautiful outer appearance. The outward appearance has no comparison now. 
The square man-made stone wall is no match for the white limestone with the beautiful etched words of the Torah glistening in the sunlight. The altar of Yahweh is to be a replica of the entire tabernacle itself. The fence that went all the way around the tabernacle always represented the Torah. The Torah scroll surrounding the, and the priest the living stones. And as they worked, they were held in place by the eastern gate, the chief cornerstone, Yeshua himself. The Torah, which means instructions in Hebrew, is the word of Yahweh, and Yeshua is the word made flesh. John 1 verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of one begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This makes him the living Torah. It is not us that people should see, but rather the glory that shines through us. That is what is supposed to affect people and drive them to be part of the house of Yahweh. Not us. It is the word that is to be seen through us. How are you living? What are you saying? Just as Moses' face was glowing when he came down from the, the, the presence of Yahweh, so too should people be able to see us aright with the joy of the Master. They should be fixated on the glow coming from the glory of the word that surrounds us protects us and strengthens us. Our wall may look uneven and weak, but when it is surrounded by the glory of the very word of Yahweh, we cannot be any stronger if we choose to stay within its protective borders. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10 Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Messiah's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I want to point out that even though every single rock used in the altar is to be uncut, placed with the others in the oddest puzzle type fashion, there is one stone that does not seem like, seem like one, but it is the most important of all. It's hiding in plain sight. The limestone plaster that covers the entire structure is the stone that has been crushed beyond recognition. Forced to watch the other stones go untouched by the blow of the master, he watched him put each one carefully into place, joining them together according to his per perfect design. But the limestone took blow after blow never understanding what he did to deserve such treatment. As each piece broke off, he thought that maybe he would be worthy to be used as a small piece to be wedged in the cracks of a larger boulder, helping to hold it in place. But when the final blow came, the limestone realized that there was nothing left of his once great statue and bright white beauty. He was crushed beyond recognition to sand. He knew at that point he would not be able to be used in the wall any longer. In despair, he hung his head, feeling useless, abandoned, and without value. Who do we know that was hung and felt useless? Who was hung on a tree? Then he felt the master build his hand, scoop him up and place him in a trough, mixing him with the water of the word. The master began to use him to fill in every gap in the wall, every crevice, and every seemingly weak spot there was until the entire structure was covered. He began to understand what the purpose of every blow and every stinging pound of the chisel had been. His master wanted to get him to the point where he would be soft and pliable enough to actually be used anywhere and everywhere the master desired. He would be a stone, a sun, that would not shy away from the final fine-tuning chisel that would inscribe the very word of the master on his now soft and pliable heart. The limestone was the last stone to be picked, but the first one to be crushed. 
His heart was broken and shattered in pieces while all the other rocks stood by in horror as what was happening to their brother. But it was all part of the master's purpose, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He needed to finish this altar by placing his word around it, and he needed a candidate to crush in order to accomplish his final plan. My friends, consider it poor joy when you face trials of many kinds. It is those crushing experiences that prepare you to receive the very word of the living Elohim. Forever etched in the deepest fibers of your heart. His blows are not without purpose. Each one is perfectly planned out. The sorrow will only last for a night. An inexpressible joy will come in the morning. When you awaken to what he has made you to be, you will choose to stay under the master's hand. Each one of you is valued and needed to fulfill his master plan. Regardless of how you view yourself, he loves you just the way you are and has a perfect spot for you in his magnificent house. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would tell you. Be thankful to your master for how he decided to make you and praise him for the final outcome you may not be able to see just yet. If you find yourself being crushed by life, hurt by others, and you feel a chisel stuck in your side, be of good cheer. It's in those painful moments that you understand that he has chosen to write his word on your heart for all to see. Never crush in the master's hand or the master's plan. Let him break you and crush you into the master's sand. Ephesians 4 verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Messiah, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make an increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. Yeah, we bless. <laughs>